Uh, we'll talk about business sustainability and sustainomics and how what I call CSR Plus can make a difference and how you can make a difference. Uh, what are the, start with the multiple global threats that undermine human development at the present time. We have a growing risk of global breakdown because you have the financial economic crisis, we have persistent poverty, we have all kinds of resource shortages, environmental problems, and of course climate change, which is the ultimate threat amplifier because it makes all the other problems worse. Now, these problems are interrelated. Uh, we need integrated solutions. Unfortunately, stakeholders are not uh, responding in a coordinated way, and particularly, there is a lack of political will at the leadership level. In fact, uh, global leaders are less and less capable of dealing with these problems, which is why I am appealing to you to try and help. Now, if you look at climate change, which uh, is my, one of my favorite topics, of course, there is an uh, interesting fact that the poor countries and also the poorest groups in all countries, including Denmark, will suffer the most. It is very unfair because they had the least to do with creating the problem, but they will pay the heaviest price. But there is a more positive aspect in that report, which says that if we make development more sustainable, in an integrated way, we can solve not only the problem of climate, but also poverty and ill health and all the other problems together. So what are the ways to do this? Uh, first, let's start with what we are doing at the moment today. And basically, if you look at the three levels of reality, we have the level of financial markets and economic growth, things like the stock market indicators, GNP growth rates. This is the monetary level which many people focus on. Below that are the productive economic assets, the labor, the, the capital resources, the, the machinery and other things that you have. And below that, of course, is the natural resource base, the lakes, the, the forests, the air we breathe. Um, in an ideal situation, these three have to be closely aligned to make the world sustainable. But unfortunately, that is not what is happening. You see the asset bubble, which was driven basically by greed, uh, has created a gap between the monetary value of assets like real estate and certain types of financial instruments, and that caused the uh, 2008 economic crisis, which is still continuing in many countries. That is the economic bubble. There is also a, few, a social bubble, and that is the bubble that there are more than 1.5 billion poor people in the world today. That is hidden by high economic growth rates, but still poverty persists, and that is a bubble which is extremely dangerous. The third bubble is, of course, the bubble of environmental externalities, that we continue to use or abuse the world's resources in such a way that we will have to pay the price later, or children and grandchildren will have to do that. And look at the way we are addressing these problems for the issue of financial problems. Six trillion or more dollars was found very quickly to solve the problem by governments, mainly to bail out rich banks and, and big companies. For the question of the poor, about 100 billion a year, which is 1 60th that amount, and for climate change and environmental problems, maybe a few billion dollars. And of course, you have world military expenditures, which is are now approaching 2 trillion. So with these kinds of priorities for spending, I ask you, are we going to solve the long-range problems of the world? And of course, I uh, also believe, having been in banking now for 40 years, that the banking sector, the financial sector, has not learned much. We seem to be returning back to business as usual, which means there's going to be another crisis. So this is not a good uh, beginning. Now, uh, let's look at sustainomics very quickly and see what we have done uh, in terms of changing the risky uh, trend into something better. First, of course, what I mentioned, that we have all these problems like poverty and exclusion and environmental problems. This is the unrestrained market forces at work without any ethical principles. It is the world of the Washington Consensus. 
governments are struggling to deal with problems piecemeal, one at a time, trying to deal with one problem, making the other problem worse. This is unacceptable. We have to go to a different world where we try to make development more sustainable, that is what sustainomics is all about, and we try to change market forces in a systematic way. We have an integrated approach where business and civil society have to actually help government, not just criticize them, but help them and push them in the right direction. I was speaking to Minister Martin Lidegaard just this afternoon, and he welcomed that kind of approach. He says, that's the kind of pressure I like because that helps me to push my cabinet colleagues in the right direction. So what are the four drivers that we need to look at? Because these are the underlying factors that are causing all the other problems that we spoke about. One is how we consume. The second one is production and the technology that we use. The third one is governance or misgovernance in the world today. And the fourth is, of course, population. So we'll focus a bit on consumption and production because that is more in tune with what you're um, talking about. Let's skip that and just talk about sustainomics. Sustainomics starts with four quick principles. The first one says that we should make development more sustainable incrementally. This is a message of empowerment. It says, let's not debate oh, what is the ideal solution. You and I, by our actions today, we know enough to make a difference, okay? And it's a bit like learning to climb a mountain where the peak is covered with clouds. We don't quite know what sustainable development is, but we don't have to waste time on that. We take one step at a time and climb upwards and eventually we reach the peak. And what are the things we can do at the individual level? We can um, eat less meat, we can use fluorescent light bulbs, we can turn off the tap when we leave the room. Many, many actions that we can take and teach our children to do it. At the corporate level, this is here, we have CSR and CSR Plus, which is basically a way of saying that it is not sufficient to have just a kind of annual report at the end of the year uh, which will position your company well, a kind of a greenwash thing. You have to have integrated external engagement where you're actually doing things, working with business, working with uh, government and civil society, but more importantly, the CSR has to go to the every level of your company and every level of activity. You have other uh, assistance through sustainability accounting and reporting, the triple bottom line, uh, analyzing not only the financial balance sheet, but also your environmental consequences and the social um, impacts of those, not only on your customers, but on, on the other stakeholders, the community, um, and so on and so forth, your employees. You have the concept of shared value, which is a link, which basically says when you do something, it's not only for the shareholders' profit, uh, but also to share some value with society. And you have also concept of impact investing, where there are savvy investors who are looking for companies that will have a good social and environmental impact, as well as financial profits. So the moral of the story is try to make a profit, that's fine, there's nothing wrong, but you can do good at the same time. And of course, at the national level, we have that, the, this thing that we have now models and methods where we can integrate sustainability into every sector of the economy, into mainstream sectors like agriculture, energy, industry, transport, and so on. There is no excuse not to do it, it's just that decision makers are a bit lazy. They don't want to do that, they want to do business as usual. So on the government side, we have much to do to make progress. The second principle um, of uh, sustainomics is the Sustainable Development Triangle, which I proposed in 1992. I'm an old guy at the Rio Earth Summit. At the time, there was some doubt about this, but basically we know that man does not live by bread alone. It's not only economic prosperity, but also the social dimension, empowerment, inclusion, and so on, and last but not least, the environment. And uh, we 
make sure that we don't force the same mold on every society. Some societies may prefer to do more social, some may prefer more on the environment, but we must keep the balance. And every activity that we look at, whether it's climate change or poverty, has all three dimensions, and we have to keep the balance among them. And just a quick word of caution with all this talk about the green economy, sometimes people have a narrow concept of the green economy. If it leaves out the social side, then I think we are making a mistake. And so they have coined the word inclusive green economy, but that is the same thing as sustainable development. So people always try to create new buzzwords, but they mean the same thing, I hope. Uh, and the last but not least, let me tell you that sustainable businesses like yourself can be a catalyst to bring stake stakeholders together so that, um, uh, and also to make sure that we focus not only on the um, manufactured capital, like the roads, the motor cars, the, uh, and other things, buildings, but also the natural capital of the world and also the social capital. The social capital is actually underplayed and undervalued. It is the glue that binds society together. It is what has uh, common values and ethics and culture, and it is the thing that keeps uh, us human beings and civilized human beings. It's very important. It is being eroded every day throughout the planet. Uh, the third principle of sustainomics is actually in our own minds, how we innovate, Particularly, we replace unsustainable and unethical values with better values. Uh, we have to be transdisciplinary because it is not a question of engineering or economics or medicine or law, but all of those and many other disciplines. We have to think in terms of long time spans, centuries, big scale, not just our neighborhood, the whole planet, and multiple stakeholders, uh, many stakeholders working together. And particularly, I would stress the question of values, especially among the youth. What the financial crisis has underlined is that greed and selfishness are, in fact, totally unacceptable and unsustainable. We have to look for selflessness, altruism, also enlightened self-interest, that by doing good to others, you can also do good to yourself. And this is very important to follow. So basically, what I'm trying to say is that unfortunately, we have, instead of a sustainability triangle, we have an unsustainable triangle. We have unethical social values with greed, selfishness, and violence at the root. It's driving an economic model of maldevelopment, which is based basically on waste and debt. Okay? And the debt is basically a very fundamental problem. Our grandparents believed in thrift. It is their savings and investment which is allowing us to have a good quality of life. But we have discovered a different truth. We feel that it is better, rather than to save, to borrow from our grandchildren and so improve our quality of life even more. But that is causing the environmental debt, which they will have to pay. And this is very uns uh, unsatisfactory because the fewer the resources, the more conflict and the more unethical the social system becomes. This is not a very good uh, model for the future. Uh, and finally, I think organizations like w uh, WCW can bring the stakeholders together. This is very important, not just business, but also engaging civil society and government uh, in the same platform. Um, and of course, finally, I must tell you that this is not just a theoretical box. There are many applications in countries, in sectors, many case studies, which I can show you uh, later as, as well. Um, let me also mention that in uh, sustainomics, there is a, a blend of what we call optimality and du durability, uh, which is basically saying that Sometimes, like in finance, we want to maximize the yield, so we take a very high risk and it fails, and that is not a good model. If you can go for a moderate or lower yield with a lower risk, but that is more durable and that is better. Okay? So there is a balance between the two that has to be maintained. Uh, so let me just move to the last uh, point, which is uh, the, some of the case studies talk uh, 
quickly about climate change and the model it presents, basically which here is the, the, the South is feeling that it is being unfairly asked to reduce uh, carbon em emissions when it is hardly emitting anything at all. But the main concern for the uh, poor countries is adaptation and vulnerability reduction because they are poor, are extremely vulnerable. It is the rich countries which has to show leadership by reducing carbon emissions. This is unfortunately not having uh, this effect. And ideally, we have to integrate adaptation and mitigation into the sustainable development strategy so that we can solve all the problems together. Now, if you look uh, at this model, you have climate risk on the vertical axis, the emissions. The horizontal axis is GNP per capita. If you are uh, at a, a poor country, your low GNP and low emissions. If you're a rich country, your high GNP, high emissions above the safe limit. And many countries are in the middle. Now, ideally, the rich countries can reduce, or the rich affluent can reduce their emissions, uh, but they can have a good quality of life. They do not reduce uh, their, the good, give up the good life, right? For the countries that are growing, and China is a very good example, they cannot afford to follow the same model of the rich countries because there is not enough carbon space in the atmosphere, there's not enough water, there's not enough energy for billions of poor people to follow the same path. So they have to find a more sustainable path and there are encouraging signs that many countries have realized this and are doing this. Uh, and so we have many models and methods to do this um, for, for, uh, for example, for energy, we have expanded uh, green national accounts, which includes environmental harm in the measurement of GNP uh, and so on. So let me come to the very last point about uh, sustainable consumption and production and millennium consumption goals. You will see that um, some time ago, Milton Friedman said, the business of a company is to make as much money as possible for stockholders. But re more recently, we have Price Waterhouse, which says that sustainability is at the top of the business agenda. So we've moved on. And the Chinese leaders, for example, are talking about the 21st century global eco-civilization, which is a point that Hu Jintao made. I'm working, for example, with the government of Bhutan, the king of Bhutan, on a concept for the UN called gross national happiness to replace gross national product, which says that GNP as yes, material consumption is important, but we have to go beyond and look at other things that give satisfaction, to move away from the consumerist, materialist society. So the vision is to meet the basic needs of all human beings, say by 2030, in a world of social justice, environmentally to respect nature and reduce the resource use to what the planet can sustainably produce, and from the economic side, to have a prosperous economy, because with so many poor people, we need prosperity, but we can respect uh, environmental and social constraints. Nine billion people can live well within the confines of the planet. This is the World Business Council, which says that. And for enterprises, I won't go through this list, you can have my slides afterwards and look at it, um, the training, management of staff on sustainability and bringing about value change is extremely important to bring sustainability into every level of the firm, but also to engage with governments to have transparent objectives. There are many things that can be done which firms can do. Uh, let's skip this part and just talk now, end with the Millennium Consumption Goals, which is one brick that I proposed at the UN to build the castle of sustainable development. It's only one point, but it can uh, make a difference. And it starts with this premise, that basically, if you look at the ecological footprint of humanity, we are consuming more than 1.5 planets Earth at the moment. So we are eating into our natural capital. It will become two Earths by 2030. Uh, there is the unfair world income distribution, which says 85% of those resources are consumed by the top 1.4 billion people, who consume 60 times more than the poorest. 
And the third point is that the Millennium Development Goals are also promising these poor people that we are going to raise them out of poverty. If you are consuming more than one planet, the rich, where are the resources for the, for the poor to raise them out of poverty? So what, what um, uh, I had suggested is that the model of the rich reducing their consumption, and this does not mean rich in rich countries, it means rich in all countries, including hundreds of millions of emerging affluent people in Africa, in Brazil, uh, in uh, Brazil, China, and so on and so forth. And those people have to follow that other tunnel path. Uh, so the poor have to be raised out of poverty, but they have to be, that has to be done in a uh, uh, in a sustainable way, and the rich have to become more, uh, more sustainable, but they can do so without reducing uh, their consumption. So the, to end here, uh, the last couple of slides, uh, Millennium Consumption Goals. The first one says we ensure the basic needs, energy, food, water, education, health, and so on, of every human being on the planet. That's number one. The second one says we try to address unsustainable consumption of the rich in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, energy, water, and so on and so forth. Also, things like lifestyles, diet, uh, and so on. Uh, and we, can, we have a go uh, Millennium Consumption Goals initiative, which is a grassroots movement, I hope you join, which is pushing this. And we are having the greatest success from the bottom up because, for example, there are 1,600 European cities that have endorsed uh, the Millennium Consumption Goals. The whole idea is that we can't wait for leaders to make a decision. They can't even make a decision on climate change, which is a simple matter, because they are too timid. We have to have cities uh, and, uh, and uh, communities, CEOs of companies, the middle level of management, who are going to make those kinds of changes, and we at the grassroots uh, have to support that. So let, let me sk uh, skip to the end here. Uh, and just tell you that the same advertising that tweaks you to consume more today can be used to tweak you to consume more sustainably. So there are a lot of things that we can do as producers. Basically, we want to make sure that sustainable consumers and producers support each other and they build a sustainable society uh, throughout. And basically, my final message we have multiple global problems which are very serious, but we have integrated solutions to solve them. We know what to do. We can do it with business and civil society pushing governments to do it. And I end with this quote from Sri Lanka. It's an ancient quote. It says, may the rains come in time, environment. May the harvest be bountiful, which is economic. May the people be happy and contented. May the king be righteous, which is social. And in, it goes to show that even in ancient times, people knew about the sustainable development triangle. We are just reinventing the wheel today. There is a book that talks about it uh, and my institute. Thank you very much indeed.